Today we're gonna do a special video. Uh, it's been actually requested by several of my viewers and followers on Instagram. Sometimes I place like little questions on Instagram, one of them being uh, Super Deco Backup, by the way. Super Deco Backup is my Instagram account, go follow me there. And so in the Insta stories I asked, which top 10 perfume list would you like to see next, right? And like seven people, I think, said top 10 perfumes to wear in Paris. Here we are. We are in Paris, in the city of love. Well, we'll go, we'll go. Sometimes it's a city of love, sometimes maybe not so much so. But we like to romanticize. Whoever doesn't live in Paris, especially who lives in the States, has this romantic sex in the city or Emily in Paris vision of Paris. Paris is not quite like that. <laughs> Take it from someone who has worked in Paris for many years in the fashion industry. It can be romantic, but it can also be quite ratchet, <laughs> quite dirty, also quite dangerous. But for the sake of kind of touching base on concrete moments of smelling in Paris, we're going to do this because I do have quite a bit of experience when it comes to Paris and perfumes in Paris. So I can tell you this, this top 10 selection is going to be not just here are the 10 perfumes you should wear in Paris, but it's also going to be a concept, right? Um, the French invented perfumery as we know it today. So the French are also... They love their perfumes. Okay, if there's one place in the world where you can still travel today and experience that vibe from the 70s and the 80s of walking down a street and having people pass by you and every single person that passes by you is wearing an incredible perfume or a very intense and strong perfume that shows character, well, that can happen to you in Paris. Nowhere else, really. And I'm traveling a lot. And I can tell you especially the center of Paris, the first arrondissement, right? And Le Marais, that's where you, where whoever passes by you, there's like a trail of perfume following you. It's amazing. It's amazing. So it's very difficult to kind of tone down um, just to 10 perfumes, right? Well, let's try. Let's give it a try, okay? We're going to give it a try. So, I want to begin, let me open up my little list here, with the first one. And the first one, I mean, it kind of goes without saying. It's a relatively new release, but the name says it all. It's actually double the trouble, double the fun. It's Chanel's Paris Paris from the Les Zoo collection. You can imagine. I mean, you can imagine that Paris Paris, I mean, a perfume called Paris Paris. Yeah, sure. They're going to call it Paris Paris. Listen, the damask rose, the patchouli, the vulgarity, ah, the dirty aspect of this thing. It, it's its gorgeous. Now, when I reviewed this perfume a year ago when it was first released, by the way, go check out the review here on my Essentially Jacob channel. Oh, while you're at it, thumb up this live stream or thumb up this video, by the way. I'm filming this video live, so I have my code chatters live here with me. But uh, thumb up the video if you're liking it and subscribe to my channel. You can also uh, join me and support the channel on Patreon, Super Deco, all spelled together for extra perks as well. So thank you to my patrons who have already pledged. Uh, and uh, this video is being filmed live, actually, in front of my patrons and members for my main channel. They get to see this video first. So when I reviewed Paris Paris or Paris Paris, I talked very clearly about a concept of gray skies in Paris, rooftops in Paris, jumping, you know, around, being happy. The morning after, the walk of shame, the morning after, you know, you're still wearing the clothes from yesterday, the hair is messed up, the gray sky of Paris is slowly lifting and you're walking home. It's an empty city because, I mean, it, dawn. It's dawning. It's late spring, early summer. There's that humidity in the air. And you're alone on that street, you know, just kind of walking by. Sunglasses. And you know, if you know, you know. That's what this smells of. 
the morning after, but also slightly bored, spoiled, rotten bourgeoisie. Mm. That's par Paris Paris for you. Number two is a particular <clears throat> heavy hitter and very symbolic to Paris. And truth be told, I discovered this perfume back in 2003-2004 in Colette. Now, Colette has closed since. I think they're thinking of reopening it. I don't know if they reopened it. But anyway, Colette in its prime time, right? Colette, and if you know, you know again. Uh, and I bought this perfume in Colette in the early 2000s, or shortly after it was launched. And now it's been reformulated, but it's still amazing. And to me, this is still a symbol of Paris. Uh, that would be Dior's Au Noir by Francis Courjan and... Uh, I can tell you, you know, when this was in the green juice as a cologne, it was a little bit more intense than it is now in the yellow juice in Eau de Parfum. But nonetheless, uh, Francis Courjan is now the artistic director of, of uh, Dior uh, perfumes. And uh, he brought back Au Noir. He reformulated it, tweaked it, made it more modern, I guess. I still love it to bits. But this is very much Paris. Uh, especially the center of Paris, you know, that memory of Colette, because Colette used to carry the first three original Les Ex um, Collection Privée fragrances, Au Noir, Bois d'Argent, and Cologne Blanche. Um, and those were the three that I bought back then. They were amazing and still are. But Au Noir is kind of, together with Bois d'Argent, you know, choose which one of the two. Both are amazing for Paris. Seriously, very, very Parisian, Bois d'Argent and Au Noir. But let's just pick Au Noir because Au Noir has been through a lot of complications and it's been gone from the market and brought back again, but then available only in France. You know, while Bois d'Argent has been available throughout all the years since it was launched, but Au Noir had more difficulties. It was a little bit more of a troubled kid. That's why I'm kind of supporting it a little bit more, you know. I love it. It's a licorice... Lavender, Immortel, Burnt Woods, Hints of Tobacco Accord. It's intense in the right way. Very, very early 2000s Paris. Really, very early 2000s Paris. And truth be told, to make it even more Parisian, it is said that, so this one was launched back in the day when Heidi Sliman was the artistic director at Dior Homme, designing for Dior Homme. And then... The these perfumes were launched as unisex, but mostly for the male range. They were kind of to be distributed again, unisex, but male. They're they're male colognes. That was the idea back then. And it is said that Hedi Sliman designed the bottles. It is also said that Hedi Sliman personally told uh, Francis Kurjan to create Au Noir for him. So it is. Legend wants it that Hedi Sliman worked with Francis on creating Au Noir because he wanted his own staple perfume for himself. I wonder if Hedi Sliman still to this day uses Au Noir and does he have enough stock, stocked up bottles of the green juice or is he now also purchasing the yellow juice? There you go. A little bit of history, which makes this perfume even more Parisian, you know, even more Parisian. Um, the next one, well, listen, Okay, the next one has to be in Paris. It, it just has to be, and I'm going to tell you why. There are several reasons for that. But it is Pour Monsieur, the Eau de Toilette. This is so Parisian. Yeah, I, can, I cannot tell you <laughs> how insanely Parisian this is. Um, and there's a really interesting reason. So... I was working with a, with a gallerist in, in Paris a long while ago, and uh, he, he is from Paris, right? And um, we were flying to, to New York, and um, no, I was on the way back from New York to Paris, and at the Duty Free, I, want, I was looking for uh, Pour Monsieur Eau de Toilette, and he told me something very interesting. He said, don't ever buy Pour Monsieur outside of Paris. I was like, really? What? Why? Why not? He said, because Pour Monsieur 
It's just like Parmigiano Reggiano, you know, because I'll tell you the story about Parmigiano Reggiano, but he didn't say the story about Parmigiano Reggiano. I know the story about Parmigiano Reggiano, but he said, Pour Monsieur can only be purchased in France or in, in Paris in particular in France, because the best quality batches, like the best ingredients are utilized for the batches for France. He's like, it's like a good wine, like a good red wine. You don't transport a good red wine too far away from its origin because it it's not as good anymore. Duly noted, and since then, every time I go to Paris, I buy a bottle of Pour Monsieur. And maybe it's just a psychological thing, but it does smell better when you buy it in Paris. So I'm telling you, I'm very prepared for this video. <laughs> so now Parmigiano Reggiano, and this is something very well known, um, is made in the Parma region. And um, the best Parmigiano is said to be sold in the Parma region. And the further away the cheese goes from Parma, the lower the quality. Like the best quality they use for themselves. And then the further away they got to send it, they send the lower quality further away. Allegedly. Everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything is just my opinion. Everything's alleged. So... Interesting how Pour Monsieur and Parmigiano Reggiano are somehow connected in a very weird way. But uh, so the next one, oh my gosh, this is, uh, listen, this is history. So we are now at number four. Number four is a fragrance that symbolizes the 30s like no other. And it symbolizes the opulence of, of Parisian couture and savoir-faire and elegance and opulence and just uh, the rich are just spending a ton of money on symbols, you know, and what better than the symbol of the most expensive perfume in the world, at least that's how it was targeted in Paris back in the 30s, and that would be Joy by Jean Patou. I have it in its uh, original bottle from the 30s. It's a re-edition. And uh, this is, what can I say? It's an indolic jasmine bomb. Okay? This thing is very sophisticated, very heavy and very sophisticated. Not everybody can pull this one off. So this is a type of high class Parisian chic. Like, and even the upper class is not really going to wear this unless they really know how to balance it well with their outfit and everything. This one is very, very, very particular. But it, it is like, this is the one I would tell you to wear if you're going to, to visit Versailles. Or if you're, you know, you're traveling to Paris and then you're going to go to some very special um, opera, you know, or theater moment, this is the one I would wear. It's, it's just, Or if you're going to go and reenact a meeting with other intellectuals, artists, you know, painters, and you're going to sit in a cafe and in, in the wee hours of the night talking and dis discussing about art and culture... This is a good one to wear. Jasmine and Dolik Bomb. Bomb. And now we come to the fifth perfume uh, that I would wear in Paris. And well, I mean, never before <laughs> has the symbology of the fifth fragrance meant actually also the fragrance. And of course, uh, Chanel number no. five. I got here a 15 ml bottle, almost empty. Uh, of course, I have a ton of these, but... I kind of like the symbology, the poetry of this kind of almost empty bottle. So this is why we have this last couple of drops in there. It's like they're trying to take away everything from you, but you're not letting go. And you're keeping that essence alive and you're you're fighting to, to preserve whatever is left. So right now, the people are here and we got to fill it up again. We got to fill it up again. Paris is also about symbolism. So 
we're introducing that as well into this perfume uh, selection. And I gotta say, when you wear Chanel Number no. Five in Paris, of course, I recommend visiting Thirty One Rue Cambon. But I also recommend just wearing it everywhere you go. The extrait, the 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 pure essence, right? With its May rose, ylang ylang, jasmine from Grasse. Um, hints of patchouli in there. There's a bit of vanilla. Um, there used to be civet in here as well before, you know, civet became kind of uh, forbidden by the IFRA. I mean, there's a ton of ingredients inside of this perfume. It is a majestic fragrance that is said to have been composed by Ernest Beau to smell of snow. Hmm. There's that. Coco Chanel in our hearts forever. Number six is a concept, okay? And I can tell you this again from Le Marais or the first, second, third, fourth, fifth arrondissement, especially in the first arrondissement and, you know, the center and Marais, you're going to smell a lot of people that are nicely dressed. They can also have that quiet luxury vibe about them. They don't have to be over the top dressed like they came out of an episode of Sex in the City. A lot of people in Paris are very, very Parisian type of dress. There's no flashy logos. But a lot of them are going to have really, really, really hardcore niche fragrances. So to that point, my sixth fragrance is actually a concept and I stated here, any heavy niche fragrance that is heavy on oud or incense. Ouds and incenses are really, really, really in, okay, in Paris right now. So since I'm not a fan of oud, I don't have a perfume here to show you right now. But just because I don't like ouds doesn't mean that they don't belong in this list. Niche ouds, it's really something... Also, niche incenses. It's really something that you really encounter a lot in Paris. So if you want to blend in into the first arrondissement and Marais and that whole shopping area, if you want to blend in, dress more like quiet luxury, no logos, and wear an oud, niche oud or niche incense of your choice. It, you smell those everywhere you go in Paris. So just saying. That's my number six tip. Number seven, listen, this goes for so many Parisians that I encounter that are living for a, a, a trip down memory lane, that are living for the 70s vibes, that are living for the 80s vibes, that are living still that memory, that flair of the 70s and 80s. They still smoke a lot on the street, you know what I mean? Like there's a, the cigarette culture in France, especially in Paris, is well and strong. People smoke in Paris, okay? There is no weird, you know, American political correctness, which I also often get on my main channel when people watch my How to Pronounce uh, French Brands uh, videos, and I did it with my friend uh, Paul a couple of years back, and uh, he's, he's, sm he's smoking a cigarette while he's talking, and people are throwing shade, like, oh my God, how dare you, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's Parisian, honey, what are you going to do about it? Well, the best, best, best uh, symbol representing the 70s, and trust you me, if you wear this perfume in Paris, you will understand, you will truly understand why this perfume is so beautiful, because this perfume was made to be worn in Paris. Seriously. Um, this perfume literally is Paris, okay? And that would be... Chanel's Cristal Eau de Toilette. Okay, it has to be the Eau de Toilette, not the Eau de Parfum. With its oak moss, with its tree moss, with its, with its ashtray accord, with its hyacinth, a bitter hyacinth, sparkly, crystalline, aldehydic opening accord. This was released in the 70s. It is Henri Robert's masterpiece. It's kind of an homage to Coco Chanel. He made this smell of Coco's character in her last years before she passed away. So yes, there's something bitter in here. There's something sad in here, but there's also hope for the future. Cristal 
and I've been talking a lot about this fragrance lately, you know, unfortunately it's on the brink of extinction because it's not a perfume that sells so much. So uh, Chanel is kind of close to, I, I fear, allegedly, is close to discontinuing this one. Now, it's already been discontinued in several countries uh, worldwide. Uh, for, for example, in, in Australia, uh, you cannot order it anymore, the EDT. In America, you can't order the EDP anymore. So it's kind of... Uh, very, very sus with the, what, what is happening to this perfume. And, of course, Chanel did not increase its price this year in Europe, which is very, very suspicious to me, because if they don't increase the price, that usually means that it's being phased out. Because they increased the price for all of their perfumes, except for the entire Cristal range, including EDT, EDP, and Auvert, EDT Concentré. So... But if you wear Cristal EDT while you're walking down the streets of Paris, you will feel something that you will not feel anywhere else in the world while wearing this perfume. Trust me, it has to be the EDT. Rumors have it that Chanel is planning to uh, segregate this one as an exclusive just to their boutiques. I don't know if they're planning on doing a Les Exclusives appropriation of this one or if this one is going to be not Ella's exclusives perfume but just like a boutique Chanel boutique like exclusive exclusive perfume which honestly I wouldn't mind if it became so exclusive a reason more to travel to Paris just to buy a bottle of Cristal because this thing is is it's history in a bottle it is Parisian history in a bottle love it to bits you have to wear Cristal EDT when you're in Paris um now number eight Okay, this is also something you will encounter a lot in Paris. People walking down the streets smelling of any current, but not just cur current, like any famous, strong, powerful smelling mass released fragrance, okay? They love their perfumes, the French, and, it, it, and the perfumes don't have to be niche. There's a snobby part of Paris where the niche, like I said before, it, it's predominant. But the outskirts of Paris, but also clubbing, or just the regular the regular folk that, that don't have 400 euro to spend on one niche bottle, they're going to go for their mass releases, okay? And the mass releases with character. So any mass release with character goes. But I have three examples for you here. Um... So the one that I would recommend, just to not be too tacky, like, because everybody wears them, but it is Alien by Thierry Mugler, but not Alien Alien, you see. I went a little bit extra. So we got Alien Lo Extraordinaire, okay? So this is a a Alien Lo Extraordinaire. So it still has that zesty punch of Alien, but it has it's a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit less pungent if you may and a little bit more its own thing so this is definitely something that a lot of uh parisians would would go for you know teddy mugler fragrances it, it, it's such a vibe and then also um jean paul gautier of course if you're going to be in paris listen i know that this one has a bad reputation nowadays because kind of all the wrong people wear it but i love it to bits and let me tell you this this one, uh, Le Mal, Jean-Paul Gaultier, but also Classique, Jean-Paul Gaultier in the EDT concentration, or if you still have the discontinued Extrait, this is perfection. I'm, a, I'm cheating a little bit here because all of these perfumes fall under my point eight, even though I'm talking about three different fragrances. But hey, the French are known to start a revolution. So listen, rules are made to be broken. While in Paris, let's blur, let's break a rule. So anyway, we got these three: uh, classic, uh, alien, o extraordinaire, and we got Le Mal. I know that a lot of people are gonna say, "Oh, Le Mal has such a bad rep nowadays." Who cares? Francis Courjean made it. Who cares if it has a bad rep? It's still one of the most amazing perfumes to have come out of the '90s. This is a lavender masterpiece. Okay. Oh my God. Similar to Cristal, when you wear Le Mal in Paris, it, it just makes sense, okay? It makes sense. Le Mal in Paris is 
it's it's like oh you know when you wear le mal in paris you go oh i get it okay this is how le mal is supposed to be worn this is how le mal uh, is supposed to smell same for classique and for all the mugleas really so yeah uh, number eight, like I said, any current heavy popular mass released fragrance, very Parisian, very Parisian. Yeah, very Parisian. Um, number nine, well, number nine also had to be, um, now in this case, one of the biggest exponents of the 80s, okay, 80s perfumery, very Parisian. Um and I love it in this particular bottle, which I'm going to lift now and show it to you. Oh my gosh, this is a masterpiece. So it is Chanel Coco in this monolith black bottle. Only. This is my favorite, okay? I This to me is 80s Paris. A lot of plastic, gold, and black. Very much old school Chanel boutiques used to be like this. Now they've changed them into something that, eh, whatever. But this, this, is, uh, this, this is where it's at, you guys, okay? Hmm. Shoulder pads and all. It's a fingerprint magnet, so bear with me, okay? Let me polish it a little bit because this baby has seen better, <laughs> better days in terms of fingerprints. But, um, and if you can hunt down the monolith refillable Eau de Parfum, this is the most 80s Parisian, I think. And again, one of those that I think they're going to discontinue. Not Coco, but they might discontinue this refillable container version. You know what I mean? They might just keep in production just a classic shaped bottle. But I do love this version the most just because it's it's so... This is Paris to me, you know? 80s. 80s French fashion revolution. Oh my gosh. Just divine. So you got a very ambery accord... There's roses in here, a ton of roses, a ton of amber. It is what used to be called an oriental fragrance, but now that word is considered a slur nowadays, so uh, we do not use it. I prefer, instead of amber, I prefer to call them Byzantine fragrances, very Byzantine. Mm, so for me, this is kind of like a Coromandel Byzantine moment for Coco. Number 10 is, listen... Number 10 is a masterpiece, and of course, there would be no Paris uh, without Yves Saint Laurent, and there would be no Paris without uh, opium. And this, I kid you not, every time, still to this day, still to this day, whenever I go to Paris, somebody always smells of opium. And it is such a beautiful, beautiful emotional moment for me when I pass by, usually the ladies, not so much the men, but you know, for me, perfume is no, no gender, but pass by, and usually, and let me tell you, usually it's a type of lady that is in her 40s, 50s, and she still has that heavy makeup like they used to do in the 70s. She has the makeup. She she has the shoulder pads. She is made up for the gods, honey. And she is walking secure of herself. Usually, you know, particular glasses, either sunglasses or reading glasses on. Mm -hmm. And she has a trail of opium following her on the street. This is something you still, to this day, encounter in Paris. So I'm telling you, you cannot do anything wrong <laughs> if you wear... Opium. Uh, the extra, of course, but nowadays people ask me, oh, they, because they've discontinued the extra. People ask me, oh, uh, so uh, which one is worth getting? Well, I'm not a fan of the current EDT formula. But if you can find the EDP, you can you can get the EDP. Yeah. you you can, The Eau de Parfum is the closest. It, it's heavily reformulated, but it's the closest to what it used to be. You know what I mean? Otherwise, listen, this was such a popular fragrance in the 70s, 80s, 90s that they've produced so many of them, which means you can find them easily secondhand markets. So just be very careful to not get, you know, fakes. Um, but uh, getting a vintage bottle is not that difficult because 
it's been so popular that they've produced so many of them, they're still in circulation, you know. So get yourself a bottle of opium when you're traveling to Paris. Wear it in Paris and you're going to feel like a Parisian, you know. Well, dress accordingly, though. And those will be the 10. But it wouldn't be Paris. It wouldn't be top 10 in Paris if we didn't kind of bend the rules a little bit. So let's start a revolution. And I'm going to sneak in an 11th perfume. And the 11th fragrance that I'm, I'm sneaking in here for y'all. And this just because it's historically so relevant. And also because it just Paris was the home of, of this kind of genre becoming so popular. We call it now the amber genre. But... You know, we, we couldn't have our Paris moment if we if we didn't have Shalimar. Uh, in this case, you can see here the extrait of Shalimar by Guerlain. Now, obviously, you know, it might not be everyone's cup of tea. I personally adore Shalimar in the extrait concentration. They still make it. They still manufacture this baby. And it is still awesome. Um you know, the ambery accord par excellence with that extra zesty citrusy moment that Guerlain is so famous for. And then the vanilla, the Guerlinade vanilla. Um, this, however, you wear if you want to go historical on Paris. OK, this is the perfume you wear if you really want to do old school Paris. OK, this is the type of perfume you wear to go to an old bookshop uh, if you want to kind of go the outskirts of Paris and visit some gardens, uh, this is the type of perfume you wear if you're going to visit some person that is old money, that is, you know, that has a mansion in the center of town and everything is draped with um, velvet and heavy velvets and old wooden tables. That That's the type of perfume you're going to wear. You're not going to wear Shalimar for modern uh, occasions. You know, this is really, really dusty, old school Paris. You want to go to the catacombs of Paris? You wear Shalimar. Nobody ever said that. I'm the first one to say it, but I'm telling you, the best perfume to wear, the catacombs of Paris? Shalimar Extra. Give those bones a ride for their money. <laughs> Let the spirits under the earth in Paris. Let them live a little. Give them that moment. Respect them. Show them respect by wearing something so sophisticated. You know, show those bones that you respect them by wearing Shalimar in the catacombs. That would be my top 10 perfumes to wear in Paris. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope I have met your standards, my dear viewers and uh, my dear French viewers. Um, if I have met your standards, please do thumb up this video and uh, consider subscribing to my channel for more content like this. And uh, as they say in France, à tout à l'heure. See you soon and uh, subscribe. Never give up, never give up on fragrant love. Bye.